So where's the waiting room? I don't see the waiting room. I gotta mute this. Can anybody hear me? Hello there. This is Tim. Can anybody hear me? Yeah, Hi. Frank Demace. Can hear you, Tim. Thanks, Doc. Believe it or not, I tried to get this up and running, and I had to do a last-minute Zoom update, and it just finished. Okay. This is know. Beth McGowan. I can hear you. Great, Beth. I don't know if Doc McHugh's on or not. I don't see his name here. There he is. Hi, Tim. Deb Cuffs. Hey, Deb. Hey, Dr. McHugh, can you hear me? Is he muted? It says he isn't muted. Dr. McHugh, are you out there? It says you are. I just got in. I was waiting for you to let okay. everyone in. Yeah, I was telling everybody I just had to do a last minute Zoom update, believe it or not. Um, so we're up and running and the game is yours. Okay. So thanks everybody for joining. Um, two people can't all be together. So we'll get started quickly. Um, get that out of the way. Hold on, I just lost everyone. Hey guys. Hey Don. Frank, how are you buddy? Tim, do you have enough with okay. this to to do attendance on it, or we need to do uh, actual roll call? Um, if I can take them off the list, I I let me see. I think I have a sheet here. Hold on. Why don't we do whoever's calling in? Got a four nine eight two and a five six nine nine. Tell us who you are. Five six zero nine nine is Jay Tyler and Sean McGuckney. And Tim, are we recording this? We are. And I am taking, I'm taking attendance as you speak. Okay, then we'll get started. Um, can you get a motion to approve the minutes from last meeting in February? So moved. Okay. I'll second. Okay. Yeah, so, um, I'm not able to identify who is that uh, approving uh, who made the motion and who approved it. We're trying to log on to Zoom right now, but if you could just tell me who, what your names are. Sure, sure. Frank Demace um, approved. And, and Don seconded. Don seconded. Don Dornan. Got it. Actually, I would I would confirm it's, it's Mike Daly that we actually have a quorum. I don't believe that we have a quorum of physicians. No, I'm, I'm, I'm adding them up now. Let's see. I know at least uh, Dr. Rushkow is trying to rearrange his afternoon to get at 2.30. Um, he had missed the update, updated time. I'm here. Hi there. Thank you. I'm here. Kathleen hey, Crispoli. Sam should be joining if he didn't already. Mike, you look awful happy in that picture. <laughs> Are any docs calling in? Because it looks like we do need two more. Can, can you hear me? I'm here, Kathleen Chris Foley. Yep, and we can see you too. It's the ones who are on the phone that we don't know if they're docs or not. Okay. Uh, Bruce Ashkow, can you hear me? Okay, we need one more. It's Bruce, can Sam you hear me? should be joining. We got yep, you, Bruce. Okay, Bruce. Just turning into a Saturday Night Live episode. <laughs> That's appropriate, Mike. 
I'm counting eight docks, guys. So is Sam on your right or left behind you? Who's coming up as iPhone? I think that's me. It's uh, Stan Wilgaki from Schenectady Fire. Okay. Uh, well, why don't we get started as a informational Dr. meeting? Pass that just texted me. He'll be here in a few minutes. Okay. So we can get through the reports. Um, so agency updates and upgrades. Uh, town of Hoosick is starting 12 lead um, at the BLS level, and West Sand Lake is starting at the Albuterol of Narcan. Uh, no ALS, BLS, or EPCR changes. Uh, public access defibrillation. Unitarian Universalist Society of Schenectady. <laughs> Don's outside. <laughs> Original, um, City Rensselaer, Norda Frontier Camp, Electrofiber Technologies, Equinox, Granville CSD, Capital City Mission, Steventown Federated Church, DSM Nutritional Products Warehouse, West Sand Lake FP, and Coho's uh, City School District. Um, missing medical director updates. Oh, the correspondence. Flipped the wrong side. Um, Correspondence Fisher Ferry, um, I'm now their medical director. Saratoga uh, Springs Fire Department is Jason Bernard, and West Sand Lake is Jacqueline Weaver. Um, Don, I'm thinking of we'll just get through the other committee reports since the academic and REMAC are pretty much combined today. Yeah, that sounds fine. Yeah. I'm going to read through Remsco real quick. REMSCO was mainly a housekeeping. You know, so we got the filters for intubation. Regional decon plan is still waiting on the sprayers, I think. Doing well with sharing information. There was a lead, EMS uh, leadership uh, webinar um, done by Drew Anderson on May 14th and discussed holding elections, um, delaying the elections um, due to not having the meetings recently. And I think that's all the major stuff from the REMSCO. Um, CMAC and SEMSCO were both delayed um, Tom, I'm assuming you didn't have any QI unless you have anything you want to report on that. Actually, it's, uh, it's Mike Rob. I can, I can bring some things across from there. I was actually hoping to have it graphically, but I've been having some computer problems. My apologies. Um, you know, for the last couple of months, we obviously got a little bit distracted from our previous QA projects, um, some of the things that were um, in the works, uh, including uh, making sure that we had business associates agreements with anybody that was concerned about sharing EMS charts data with us. Um, that sort of is put on hold and we have to pick that back up again. Um, the process of making sure that we have a single regional data dictionary um, specific to uh, patient complaints and dispositions um, is actually continuing to move forward through EMS charts. Um, and we looked at some, some data in particular, uh, just to get a little bit more of an idea for you guys. Um, and just to highlight, um, in February of 19, um, we had, and I'll give you these results both for cardiac arrest and for naloxone utilization, because they sort of go hand in hand. Um, so in February of 19, we had 93 cardiac arrests. Um, in February of 20, we had 101 cardiac arrests. Those are essentially relatively similar. 
Um, so going from February, March, April, and May in 19, it was 93 in February, 107 cardiac arrests in March. April was 84 cardiac arrests, and May was 83. That's the data that we have grossly from, um, from what we have in EMS charts. Rob's got it up in front of you on the screen. If you look at 2020, uh, pretty dramatic change. The 101 in February, I would argue, is basically statistically relatively similar to where we normally end up. Um, so February, probably not a major change. But March, we go up to 119, which is well beyond any month that I looked at in 2019. And April, we shoot up to 145. Looking grossly at May, we actually had 153 cardiac arrests, but 10 of them were actually listed as sales demo cases, and I don't believe those were actually real cases uh, because they all occurred at exactly the same time. So that seemed a little bit unlikely for 10 cardiac arrests to occur exactly at the same time. Uh, naloxone utilizations, I'm not going to read the numbers to you um, for 19, uh, but there's a relative standard of 65 utilizations or so per month on average. And then um, 2020, we go up to 83 in April and 102 in May. Um, there are a whole lot of different reasons that have been cited so far in some of the preliminary um, papers that I've seen and some of the papers that I've edited. Um, but um, these go all the way from less access to medication-assisted therapy to um, different access to um, points, of, uh, points of sale. So a whole lot of different, uh, different reasons, but certainly elevations in naloxone, increases in cardiac arrest, and uh, gross decreases in uh, the number of calls through April or March and April and into May. So... That's what I have right now. Thank you. Does anyone else, any other docs join since we started? Can you hear me, uh, Robbie? Okay, I think you make our nine. Yeah, Dr. Hassett too. Okay, perfect. So next on the agenda would be getting into uh, new business which discussion on anything to do with um, COVID and um, I think we need to get back on people for maintaining the, the PPE standards. Mike, you want to discuss that? Sure. There's um, two different extremes of, of maintaining the PPE standards. The first is people that seem to be um, relaxing and frankly forgetting the PPE standard and not using masks when they're in patient contact. Um, I think much like those of us who are around for patient care when uh, we started worried about bloodborne pathogens and started to wear gloves, um, we're in a strange new world, and now for every patient encounter, you're going to be wearing a mask, and that's just the way that needs to be. We need to make sure that we're keeping ourselves safe. The other side of it, though, are the people who go way over the top, and I'd ask docs to please work with their agencies and, and guide them on this. There are people that are putting on full Tyvek bunny suits, um, moving people with, um, without symptoms. And that's concerning. And it's concerning not only for using PPE that we may need other times, but more appropriately, um, using these and donning and doffing correctly is going to be the, the best way to maintain our, our safety. Some of the folks that I've seen have actually arrived in full bunny suits and then have gotten back in their ambulance with the full, um, full PPE, including N95 and bunny suit, and driven back to their station in order to decon. And then they decon the front of their ambulance as well. Uh, that's not a best practice and quite frankly, I would be extremely concerned about how people would be operating their ambulances wearing this gear. In one case, people were actually wearing a, uh, a papper hood and a bunny suit and operating their ambulance. Um, that, uh, 
that just concerns the daylights out of me in terms of being able to do that safely because I'm sure that the loss of peripheral vision that you have in that papper does not make for a safe driver. So um, I think we just have to make sure that we're being as vigilant as we can in making reasonable decisions about PPE. Gowns, absolutely, if you're taking care of somebody. Um, appropriate mask, N95s in most agencies, absolutely fine. Um, full Tyvek bunny suit for every patient encounter, um, probably not reasonable and really not safe to be operating a vehicle that way. Any other discussion or comments on the PPE? Um, next up is uh, AHA is extended, um, wearing cards are good for. Um, I forget what the last update was. Is that for three months or is it indefinitely at this point? AHA had granted a 60 day initial uh, grace period. Um, my suggestion would actually be that we extend the grace period that we have given people until September um, and then give them the opportunity to come back at, in September. Um, certainly some other folks had said, let's just take it to 21 uh, and I leave that open for discussion. AHA has actually extended theirs till the end of October and sunset it at that point. Hey Beth, it's Scott Bowman. Do you have that? Um, do you have a document from them that you could forward out? Because the last one I could find on their website was 120 days, which um, and, and but the reason I brought this up with Dr. Doynow and Dr. Daly was really more about the the language in that advisement from AHA. It said that it was a, you get an additional 120 days beginning in March, but it didn't say ending when. So in theory, and th this document I'll send to you lays it out clearly. Ah, excellent. So maybe, it, um, it, maybe I it, wasn't the only one that emailed them and complained about their horrible document. Yeah, they, this document lays it out clearly and does give local re regions the ability to make a change if they absolutely have to. Awesome. So that has come out since uh, my conversations with Dr. Doyle and Dr. Daly. Yeah, if you could forward um, that out and tell us, that'd be awesome. Yeah, it came out on, just give me one second. I thought we'd just send that to Tim because yeah, we'll do. I'm sure everyone else is looking forward to. So do we need a motion to go along with that and pair that or do we just going with what the AHA put out? Why don't we just make a motion that we'll accept until the end of October then we don't have an issue. Okay. Anybody with a second? I'll second that. Okay. We have this hand first if we're like seconded. Okay. Um, resumption of field internships. They were shut down and probably about time to start opening them back up. We have to vote on that. We made a motion seconded by it. Do we hear a vote? Oh yeah, all in favor of um, extending the AHA um, expirations until October. Aye. Yes. Yes. Any opposed? Okay. I just have it on that one. Um, so field internships. So they were on hold for a while. I know some some uh, areas are resuming. I don't know if we need a motion to do that or not. Mike and I had a discussion on it. Uh, Mike, you want to chime in at all? Or? I think it's fine right now, as long as people's um, PPE supplies can support it. I certainly don't have a problem with it at this point. Um, the responsibility of protecting the- uh, I think he was gonna um, say the we kind of lost him there. So is that, well, is that I don't think that's something we need a motion on though, or do you think we do that? Um, no, I don't think so. I don't Absolutely. think we need a motion, but but this body saying let's let's open it up and go forward again makes a ton of sense. Yep, let's let's go forward. Get those guys out there. Okay. So, Mike, get a psychiatric patient update. So 
So I would love to tell you that I had more, uh, more impressive news to share. Um, Sam and I think we're both a little frustrated yesterday. Um, we were supposed to have a, a meeting with CDPC and the, uh, the organizations in Albany um, to have a conversation about what we were doing with psych patients. Unfortunately, that meeting was canceled. So um, what do we do with psych patients? Um, continue to hope to do our best the same way we've been doing. Um, we don't have any, uh, any new great answers. Sam, do you have anything better than that to add? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, Mike, I agree with you. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have, I don't have much to add either. I'm assuming that we will get that um, meeting rescheduled. Uh, I think actually this last meeting was coordinated by Heather from your department, Mike. Uh, so, uh, hopefully we can get it back on the books soon, but there's no easy answer to any of this, uh, given how CDPC has, uh, opened up its, uh, reception of patients from across the state now, as opposed to just our local region. It's really created a lot of capacity issues for uh, all the uh, hospitals in, the, in our region. So I, I, I don't have any more information than what Mike has said. We'll hopefully continue the dialogue and see what we can do. I think the one thing that I would add to that, and I think it's really important is, you know, through both our discussions with CDPC, as well as all the trials and tribulations around COVID, what we have certainly done is developed um, some really good uh, dialogue between the hospital systems. And I think that's the only thing that we have that's positive moving forward on this. Um, because with CDPC having limited capacity and then actually having a problem with some exposures to COVID, which reduced their capacity further, um, that's led to some significant problems in the city of Albany. Agreed. So with that warming news, um, ketamine, it's been in place in a few services for a couple of years. Um, Mike, you want to talk about taking more broadly to the rest of the services? I think one of the things with, with a drug like ketamine is um, I don't think we're at a point yet across the region where we can mandate it. I think actually the Bureau of Narcotics Enforcement would get angry with us if we did. Um, but I certainly would suggest to the agencies out there that are not yet uh, deploying ketamine that they um, consider moving towards it. Um, I am going to move towards it with some of the agencies that I work with that do not yet carry it. Uh, because the more consistency we can have across services, the better off we'll ultimately be. And what we found certainly with the opioid crisis, as well as um, with some of our trauma patients, um, having the ability to use pain dose ketamine has been quite helpful. And we've also found with some of our extremely violent patients that the ability to do um, chemical restraint with ketamine um, has potentially saved some uh, staff and law enforcement injuries. So I think there are enough good reasons for us to expand this across uh, more agencies. And I certainly would encourage uh, all of the medical directors to consider this. Hey, Doc. This is Jay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Loud and clear, sir. Okay. Um, regarding uh, ketamine, as long as we're um, on that topic, uh, I, know, I think that Dr. Doyle now had mentioned something to you about the protocol um, directing uh, providers to administer it fast, a rapid IV. Um, the government's been doing the, the RSI for a while now and generally use the Atomidate and know that the, uh, the, the Remo um, educational material um, de describes and discusses on how to administer, and it, it all says slow. Now, and I work a part-time job, and they're teaching uh, rapid IV push um, with ketamine, and I did some research on it, and I know there's a small percentage chance of causing laryngospasms, um, but uh, my concern is with a, a procedure like rapid sequence intubation, which is controversial at best, um, is rapid IV push for ketamine um, the best way to administer that? Uh, 
I'll, I'll weigh in on that. I, I don't think that's advisable. Yeah, and the way the, the Remo treating, uh, Remo uh, um, training basically said uh, greater than 60 seconds. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a slow <laughs> IV push uh, medication to, uh, to try to reduce that issue in and of itself, laryngospasm being one of them, but I, I think it's a slow IV push medication, at, you know, over a minute or two at the most, but, but should not be an IV push bolus type situation. Particularly if you're doing for the, the pain dosage, you're going to get more side effects if you push it quickly. Yeah, if you're using it for pain, slow. The ideal would actually be put it in a mini bag and let it run in. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I would also agree with uh, over a minute or two for um, if you're using for RSI. So we may want to change that in the in the app because the app has basically a rapid IV push, which could be interpreted the same as giving it adenosine, unfortunately. Yeah, because technically a slow of IV push is over four minutes. Is it worthy of a REMAC advisory? I think we definitely need to change it in the, in the app. I think I would change it in the app. I would make sure that there's nothing in the education that says rapid IV push. I would remind people that we do it over more than a minute or two that we're actually not doing RSI anymore. Um, and RSI, as we have said, is uh, the combination of medications. So actually, if you're giving it and a paralytic, the laryngospasm becomes less of an issue. But I agree not the rapid IV push. Um, maybe it's just a brief training on administration of ketamine to include the pain dose um, going into a mini bag and the, uh, um, the RSI dose I'm being on. administered IV push and do it that way. Upload that and push it out. Yeah, I, I agree, Mike. I, I'm much less concerned with IV push for RSI with a paralytic involved, then we're talking uh, for pain control. Pain control should not be a rapid IV push, in my opinion. Agreed. <laughs> Who did that cut off? Okay. Um, next would be, we've had good results with the nitroglycerin IV. We continue to have really good results with uh, nitro IV. Um, I had uh, forwarded to Don and, and to Lou Marshall, and we'll discuss that at the med standards meeting at the end of this month, um, depending on when that ends up getting scheduled. But um, I think this region is leading the way again with that. To the agencies that are participating, thank you very much. And to those that are patiently awaiting it, we still await the official dispensation from Part 800 that doesn't allow us to carry more than 249 mLs in a glass vial, even though that request went in uh, an awfully long time ago. Um, hopefully that will, will come through at some point. Mike, what's the history on that? Why, why such a weird number? Is it like when we used to use glass IV bottles? All I can think of is that, you know, when you're talking about the Part 800 originally being written in the mid 70s, I suspect that D5W was also available in glass vials, in large glass vials, as well as in, um, in early plastic bags. So the goal was to make sure that people weren't rattling around with a bunch of D5W in glass. But that's all I can really come up with, Mike. I can't come up with any other good excuse for that. Very clearly, it's to prevent something that was carried in 250 ml um, containers. Yeah, that, that makes sense. What I do like is the answer that somebody said was that once we remove one ml from that vial, it now has 249 mLs in it. Therefore, there's never anything to preclude that being carried on an ambulance to the hospital. It just can't be stored on the ambulance 
all the time. So I think that's very creative, very appropriate thinking, and is a good way to assure that we're providing optimal patient care. But it limits the services that a supervisor car and not just the ambulance. Exactly. Okay. Is anyone going to act on that? If it's going to the Met Standards Committee, anyway, we'll just wait for the results of that meeting. Um, Don, do you have anything specific for the operation slash formally academic agenda? No, not specifically. Just info. The CMAC and SEMSCO meetings, as well as Med Standards, should be at the end of the month. It looks like, again, it's going to be probably a Zoom meeting, 23rd for Med Standards and other committees, 24th for CMAC and SEMSCO. So hopefully that will occur. Okay. So next thing I want to talk about is um, old business. Um, Malta um, Med has uh, put forward a, a set of protocols for receiving ambulances to their um, emergent care facility. It's basically the same thing that we came up with um, in conjunction with them regarding our Clifton Park facility, uh, but with the COVID epidemic, they went a little bit um, further down the road with that. So I just wanted to put it up for um, a discussion. So most of this is sort of uh, limiting out what we really shouldn't be taking to a place with more than an urgent care, but less than the ER and no upstairs to send people to quickly. So if it pretty much comes up that it looks like they're gonna be a slam dunk, they need to be admitted or an ICU, don't bring them here. If they're unstable, don't bring them. Um, and if they're gonna be a social slash security issue, don't bring them. Um, then they have some basically a medical command class, some stuff on the edge, and then what they, they would accept. Uh, I think right now this may be on hold for the time being, uh, waiting on for some legal. Uh, the idea behind this coming out early on was that we're going to take the pressure off of the ERs, but we felt that that wasn't the problem. I have a question about this. Yeah. Because when the whole COVID thing started and I was preparing to, you know, what if I have to do this? Um, urgent care centers don't have an obligation to see patients if they show up there and they can't pay. Exactly. So part of doing the ET3 and then expanding that out to non Medicare population would be they would have to agree to take what came if they wanted to participate in this. So it may drive some business to them, but they will get a non-paying patient once in a while. This kind of jumps beyond that regional approach to doing that. But does that need to be added to these types of agreements? That probably would be, but this is not one of those agreements. This was just, it looks like this was just gonna be between multi-med and multi-EMS. Got it, thank you. So regardless of I think, Dan, you bring up a really important point, which is that if any urgent cares are going to participate in this, um, they need to be able to say, we'll talk to you about your patient before it gets to us, and then we will take care of that patient regardless of what occurs. There will be some swings and misses, and urgent cares are going to need to decide whether or not that's a risk that they're willing to take um, to give away free care by mistake um, because a patient gets there without any insurance coverage. Uh, because if this ends up being a situation where we're transporting people twice, we've failed. So in terms of alternative destination, um, I'm a firm believer in the idea. I think it's a great, it's a great one, but I think what you still need to do is to come up with a, um, a set of guidelines, both for the 24 hour um, advanced urgent cares, as well as for any of the 12 hour urgent cares for how they will participate in it as EMS receiving facilities. And I see that as something that we need to make sure that we main, maintain control over 
uh, to assure that it's being done safely. Hey, it's Matt. <clears throat> Correct me if I'm wrong, but right now, uh, the Ellis and Clifton Park and Malta Med both operate under the Article 28 license and actually already are in a position where they would receive patients, you know, with a typical emergency department MTAL approach. Well, I think yes, that's the case for those two. Yeah, we're the only ones that follow MTAL around here. Malta Med, yeah, Malta Med does not follow MTAL. Wilton Med does. So what, what happens at Malta? They're considered a doctor's office still. They're not found by the Antala. If you remember correctly, Matt, Malta Med is run as a consortium between Albany Med and Saratoga. Right. And because it falls outside the system, it therefore doesn't fall under Article 28. What's going to happen as the system coalesces, it, it will change. But as of right now, that's where it is. But I think Understood. the standards yeah. remain the same across all of the um, – non-admitting facilities. Right, and I think today Multimed still operates as if, right? Even though they may not be required to. Uh, they're not out turning away patients, when, right? Well, they're not, tur they're not turning away patients um, that, that I know of in general. Um, and anytime they're transferring a patient out, they're certainly calling people to let them know that they're coming. Um, right. So, they're, they're fulfilling the spirit of uh, FM Tala, uh, but they are not beholden to it. Right. Where Ellis Rob is, and so yes. it's functionally covered in that way and doesn't need a different agreement today, although it would make sense to have a blanket regional approach to this and just have everybody in agreement that you yeah, take so all Back in probably. August, October, we had agreement from Emergent Care Well Now. Um, and yeah, the St. Peter's group was absorbing. Well Now was absorbing the St. Peter's group for that. And we all had agreement with um, some basic protocols for the regular urgent cares and what they would take. And then um, Multimed and else, um, Clifton Park had uh, basically the same thing written here, just Dr. McDonough did a much better job of um, typesetting it than I would have. I'm just trying to dig up the, the protocols we had. I don't have that up right now. Basically, it's much more limited to go to the regular urgent cares and they had all agreed that they would take whatever they came as long as we made some sort of a due diligence approach to see what they had. If they, if they show up and their cards expired, then they'll deal with it. But if they're completely uninsured and they don't have a ride home, please don't bring it to us. Right, an important distinction. I mean, we're talking about distinctions on medical condition is one thing, distinctions on, on medical insurance and coverage is a totally different animal. So I think right now this is more for thought provoking than needing emotion or anything like that. Any other thoughts or discussion on this? I just wanted to mention it's very well written. She usually does good work like that. Okay. That's it for what I have on my agenda. Does anybody have any discussion topics for the floor? Rob, I have I one element of new. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that was no, go, going ahead. go ahead. I have one element of new business. Um, I had a chat with Diana Langdon this morning, who is currently the acting chief of emergency medicine over at the VA. And one of the things that she's facing right now is a stream of um, locums, tenants, providers that are coming in. She's credentialing and then putting on, on service over there. One of the problems they're having is that they are receiving patients within the um, within the Remo system. These are non-Remo docs. 
They would like to provide medical control on the patients that are coming to them. And as we've said before, any physician can give medical control on a patient that is coming to their care. My suggestion actually is twofold. The first is that we develop a VA specific, and I say VA specific because the other hospitals actually have less need for locums and uh, have more volume, uh, but a VA specific Remo facility ID that would allow um, Dr. Langdon to put locums physicians on as able to take calls from ambulances that are incoming to them. But along with that, she would require as part of her credentialing process an awareness of the protocols and awareness with our formulary so that the docs that are taking care of the patients um, would understand the capabilities of our EMS system. Um, this is a little different than we've ever done before. I think would go a long way to increase her efficiency and would also provide um, better care over at, uh, um, over at the VA associated with EMS with these locum stocks. I would make a suggestion that not just be VA specific, but be applicable to any facility on a temporary basis. So Sam has six docs go out on leave for some reason. He all of a sudden needs a lot more. He could apply for this. If one of those docs ends up staying for more than a few shifts, then they go through and get a Remo number. But in the meantime, they can operate under that facility license. Um, but that would not be for an extended time. Like it wouldn't say maybe six months or something, you continue to use this. The goal is to build up to actually have docs who are, have a Remo number in, in the system. That's a great idea, Rob. I like that a lot. Because we had a while where we were using locums a lot and it was, I would give them a couple shifts if we thought we were going to keep them, then I would work on getting my remote number. But I also have two docs on at all times, so I could afford here you hold the phone and you don't answer the phone. I agree. Sounds like a good idea. My, uh, my only concern, uh, guys, is does the medic have a... Uh, if the medic is dealing with a situation that they are getting very uncomfortable with relative to the uh, orders or direction they're getting from the base station physician that doesn't have a formal Remo number because they're not a formal Remo physician, what is the recourse for the medic to find medical direction from another base station if necessary? In other words, I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but I think the medics need to have an out if they're dealing with a situation of a non-REMO certified physician giving them direction and they're getting very uncomfortable. What do they do? Uh, Sam, I think that's very reasonable. And I think there's, there's already basically um, a quiet and tacit um, uh, sort of sort of set of circumstances that exist in that. And I'm looking at, uh, at Don sitting under his tree and Bruce in front of his bookshelf and both <laughs> of them are smiling a little bit because the What's three of us know that if somebody's not so crazy about the orders they're getting and they happen to think the doctor's out of their mind, what they'll usually do is pick up the phone, call one of the three of us and have us call the doc that they think is out of their mind um, in order to, correct whatever they perceive is going on. Um, on occasion at the med, we will get that medical control call for the, hey, we're getting orders and they don't really make sense. Um, in which case an attending will, will uh, get involved. Um, but honestly, it doesn't happen very often. Yeah, I think whatever these numbers are need to be clearly designated like a 900 number or something well out the range of a new usual number to highlight that this is a, a temporary thing because from my experience, locums, 10% are really good and like to move around, 90% can't keep a job. So I think that crazy orders may be a possibility with this. Yeah, I just wanna make sure that the medics know that they have a, an escape route, if you will, if they need to uh, in a bad situation. Not that we want that to happen, but just in case. 
Sam, your point is great. And I love the way that Michael worded that because it, it's very true. This has been going on for years um, where multiple people receive phone calls sort of on side and we, we take care of it. Yeah, and, I, and I've received them in the past as well. So I, I do understand that you guys get a much higher frequency of it than I would, but I used to get them as well. Hey, it's Matt. I think, you know, the, the safety valve approach makes tons of sense. Good point, Sam. With that said, it also puts the onus a little bit on the medic to appreciate where things might be getting off and, and give them, they'd have to have the judgment to, to do that. And I think they'd still be having to deal with those orders up front. And I think it may not to create, you know, more work out of this, but at some point soon, maybe it's worth reviewing. What is it? What does it mean for for this remac to uh, to provide say the equivalent of temporary privileges for you know the, the way a hospital would for locums docs and and just make sure we have that in place and then maybe just put the onus on those bringing in locum docs to say look you, you really do need to make sure your folks read through these protocols and stick to them and have a clue and still keep the safety valve but make sure that the locums docs actually do a pretty good job, you know, some due diligence up front. It's really not that heavy of a lift, I don't think. The other thought is if we're talking about the, this whole region, they may be dealing with patients from, uh, from, a, from a, a medic in another region like Mountain Lakes. So the reciprocity question might come into play here. The thing Just to, to remember is, you know, yeah, I, I, I think that you're, you're partially overthinking it, but also um, the reason that I suggested to Diana that she leave it in a position where it's part of her credentialing process, so it actually creates a much higher standard than we currently have um, across, the, across the region. Um, and I think, it, um, I think given the adherence that they have within the VA system to rule following, uh, I think that will go extremely well. The other advantage that we have is that the VA as a whole um, does not get a significant amount of EMS volume, and that's helpful as well. Because um, the last thing I wanted to do is create more work for Dr. Chris Safoli, who I think is on the call right now, um, and will be the one who will end up, uh, I suspect, being responsible for orienting many of these folks uh, to the, uh, the remote protocols and formulary. But if this is applicable as, as you guys had suggested, which I think is a, a very reasonable suggestion to other sites that may need to be using heavy locums from time to time, the frequency of these calls and interactions with our medics could be a lot higher than we expect. You know, if, uh, if uh, a location like Ellis or a location like St. Peter's or a location like uh, Saratoga might be, uh, you know, utilizing this opportunity in addition to the VA. I agree, Sam. I think that one of the things that, um, that makes a lot of sense is the, you know, what is the number of shifts that that person is going to be working there? And I don't know if there's a single number that is the answer, um, but if they're going to be around for a while, they should be a part of the system. But if they're not around for a while, they should be able to function within the system. Um, and I think that will fall to the REMAC representative from each of the hospitals to make that decision on how to, um, how to bring somebody on board. I'm happy to say more than 10 shifts, but I don't think that means that someone's use of the temporary number expires on their 11th. Yeah, and you know, maybe it, it might make sense and I don't know what you guys think about this because you won't be able to differentiate the individual except by backtracking and seeing who was on the schedule and so forth. But identifying a single number that would be used as a physician who would fall into this category, like maybe it's, you know, Remo Doc 911 or something. I don't know. Uh, maybe we want a number for each hospital. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that way you can track back, oh, this is, I, I was a locum stock at Ellis. Exactly. That way we're not assigning individual numbers to, to, to transient physicians, but you've got, like at Ellis, it's 
9-10. At St. Peter's, it's 9-11. At Saratoga, it's 9-12, whatever. But, you know, something to that effect that everyone understands this is a temporary physician who's taking this call, and the medics recognize that right away. I love that idea. And the number I would suggest is the hospital encoder code. Was, and that way it jumps right out that. of everybody. Everybody that already knows it. This is a temporary, everybody knows it. And they also know that that doc isn't someone who has been through formal base station training, at least not in our region. No, I, would, I think the one thing that I, I, the one thing I would be very careful with, um, and I, I think the idea of using the hospital base station number makes a ton of sense. Uh, the one thing I think we have to watch carefully is then we have to see how many of these there really are to make sure that people aren't just um, randomly using numbers in order to get away from seeking medical control when they have an answer. So we have to keep an eye on how many of them there are, how many utilizations there are. So maybe this goes beyond this call and I will preface this with, I will volunteer to work on a, on a, on a process and an approach so it's a little money where my mouth is. I will say I would worry a little if it, they're tied to just that number because it, it would facilitate having locums who never read anything, didn't do this stuff, use that number, and we're not actually creating any diligence around making sure they know what they're doing. It's just the other side of that coin, but I'm not out to complicate it, and I appreciate, Mike, to your point. This is easily overthought, and I'm not trying to do that. If there's interest in creating a temporary credentialing process that's time limited and we just ensure that these folks have done the basic due diligence and then it's a time limited approach I think that's probably something that could be put in place relatively quickly if there's agreement on what that credentialing bar height is so I'll, I'll leave it there I don't want to push the issue but I, I'm happy to discuss it if, if there's interest in doing that Hey guys. Can I just add one suggestion here on this? Because as you build this process, and I've already heard, and I think it's a great idea to say that, you know, MD462 is the Ellis temporary MD. Well, there's already an MD462. I don't know who it is. I don't have the system pulled up, but um, mm -hmm. I think I'm going to leave that part to Deb and Jesse, Jessica because they know the numbers that are free. Um, and I think we need to rework those numbers a little bit, but just you got to leave it loose enough as you build that system so that they can have the room to make the adjustments in Remo ALS. Can we make it a four digit one and we make it nine, four, six, two? So it's clearly something that's clearly out of the system. We, um, we're going to make all the position numbers, four digit numbers. And the first digit was going to have to do with the region because we have multiple regions all using the same protocol now and we're crossing over regional lines. So the goal was to add a fourth digit to identify which region that, uh, you know, that was coming from also has to do with the phone system and it's complicated, but uh, a nine in front of that would make sense. Well, it has to work. This system has to work in conjunction with three other systems out of the Remo ALS office, just so everyone's aware. Not to speak for the Remo ALS office, just being there formally. So do you need a motion to approve a, a temporary credentialing or temporary designation process? This is Bruce. Why don't, why don't we make the motion? I was going to say, what, why don't we make a make the motion to create an eight, a facility specific Remo number um, along with a process that would audit that um, and give me and Tim and Deb the latitude to come up with something that'll work. Bruce, did you have something? No, I, I agree, and that's great. I'll second the motion. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Yes. Any opposed? Okay, that carries. Any further discussion for today? Uh, I think Jay wanted to bring something up. I'm sorry, Bruce. By the way, no, you Jay look first. very different. Here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for reminding me about that, Doc. Um, so 
I don't know if all the docs are familiar with the CARES Act. Uh, some of the EMS agencies have been, re been reimbursed um, with a grant on the initial one. On the second one, um, the CARES 2 Act, um, there was funds available for COVID-19 patients that um, um, didn't have insurance. Um, the government was going to, going to pay for those uh, individuals who were transported, diagnosed COVID positive, uh, and didn't have insurance. Um, I'm not sure what the other EMS agencies have done with, with trying to get the diagnosis. Um, Albany Medical Center is very good um, in our, about providing feedback, um, and we were able to get um, at the last minute some info from St. Peter's Hospital from Dr. Duenow and Dr. DeMay, so thank you for that. Um, we're still having, um, well, it, it's kind of too late now. Um, we don't get f feedback from any other hospital. Um, and some are claiming, you know, there's a, a HIPAA issue and, and things of that nature. I'm curious as to what uh, some, maybe some of the other EMS agencies have done and if, if there's a regional approach we could take to um, get in some feedback for, you know, not only for COVID-19 patients, but maybe something, some kind of initiative, um, uh, you know, for even uh, a more regular basis, but particularly with COVID-19 patients, because um, there's a reimbursement issue there that we're not able to get if we don't have a diagnosis. Uh, I'll, I'll just jump in to say, you know, when the initial request for this information came across, that was on everybody's mind, but... In fact, uh, we're allowed under HIPAA to share information for billing purposes with agencies that were involved with the care of the patient. So uh, HIPAA is not really an issue uh, in this case, unless you're really disclosing a lot of information that you shouldn't be disclosing. So uh, giving, giving out the COVID status uh, on the patient uh, relative to the need for billing is really appropriate and uh, for this specific purpose for billing uh, to another agency. So I just, for those on the call, I just want to let you know that that's okay. We, we actually vetted this uh, through our legal counsel uh, before sharing the information to be sure that it was HIPAA compliant, and in fact it is. We, we thought it was, but we didn't want to release this information before getting a legal opinion. And at least from our perspective, our, our legal advice was that it was okay. Right, so I, I think that uh, at least on, on behalf of Gillerland, um, I think, I, I guess I'm, I'm asking for the REMAC, a little bit of help. Um, facilitating some kind of feedback channel from the other hospitals. I don't know if a, a letter or a request or something um, could take place, but um, yeah, we weren't able to get it from all, uh, hospitals other than St. Peter's and Albany Medical Center. If there's any other EMS agencies, uh, Scott, um, did you guys file for the CARES too? Um, reimbursement. I'm just curious as to what any other EMS agency did with that. We did not because the the number that we had that we believed were COVID positive and uninsured um, was low enough that the work it would have taken us, the number of hours it would have taken us to track it all down, put it all together, submit it, um, wasn't worth it to us. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did not. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really have anything to add other than I think this is a great illustration of um, the difficulties that we've faced in EMS uh, for a long time in getting good feedback from the hospital and whether it's um, feedback, um, and I'll, you know, pat Art on the back a little bit with um, regards to mm -hmm. just stroke calls and uh, STEMI calls and you know, other calls that maybe we brought in where the treatment wasn't great and we were able to get some, um, you know, really timely feedback um, to the providers for education purposes. Um, the I know it's a lot of um, resource to put in to having a person doing that job, uh, but I think in terms of how it improves the system as a whole, um, 
you know, I think it's uh, just incredibly valuable. So, you know, for what that's worth, I think this whole thing with the COVID has illustrated a lot of uh, things about the system that we can improve. And I think this is one of them. I think having say, the St. Peter's system and the Ellis system also have similar people um, would be fantastic. So I mean, it's just my two cents on that whole situation. Again, I know easier said than done. You guys all have people you have to answer to as well. Actually, uh, I, I agree. Yep. I would like to add to that because actually it's easier done than people really think it is. Because right now, Albany Med now has successfully implemented their HL7 bi-directional feed. And so you can connect your EMS chart patient care record and the hospital care record through their Sorian through EMS charts. When you, uh, in the EMS charts, you create a chart and that top, the, uh, when you select Albany Med, a ribbon appears and it helps you connect the patient and their ER to your chart. And when you do that, their information back feeds into your chart, their, um, their, their billing information. And so, and they're, they're doing this flawlessly, by the way. And, um, and so as this grows and this continues to th be a thing, as a group, we need to start teaching our medics and our EMTs to make sure you make that connection and you make that match that it has to be done on the EMS side as well as, a, as the hospital side to be truly efficient. Um, when you connect the two charts, the, the data flows. And so that, that portal is made already for Sorian. Albany Med did the hard work. So very easily, Ellis will be able to do it in the near future. And I think they're the only ones on Sorian. Um, I know that we're on Cerner and their work, IT is working on it now. On Cerner. And so um, I know that St. Peter's doesn't want to invest in that because they're going to move on to Epic, but there is a fee for Epic too. But this not only works for billing information and for pre-populating hospital stuff. When you pull your stuff in and it, pull, it pulls the EMS stuff and goes back and forth, um, STEMI alerts, stroke alerts, any other kind of alert you want to put any name on it, it all those data and that information that's supposed to be fed back to the EMS providers, it can be automatic. And, and all they met has done a fantastic good job at it. And I think that um, it's just a matter, a matter of time, really over the next year, I don't see why other than money that we can't make this happen. And so something for everyone to think about is where do we find money to make this happen? Because like, it, it's gonna cost, it's about a dollar a chart that you connect on an annual, you know, every, on a year going forward. But EMS Charts is actively working on this. And now EMS Charts and Zola are one company that includes all the Mohawk information, all the Zola information. That includes everybody basically in the region, except for some of, uh, for most of Green County. So it makes sense for us to really push and maybe even back it financially. Maybe the, the region can finance the setup for the different hospitals so that we can get this going and be up to date with the rest of the country. I'll speak for St. Peter's for now. Right now, uh, we were going to be moving to Epic, but with COVID occurring, that got pushed back into what we hope to be 2021. And HL7 has been in on our mind. Uh, but for right now, it's not gonna fix our short run problem. But down the road, we have every thought of doing that. So here's the other interesting twist with this. I had a long conversation with the guys at EMS Charts the other day. And one of the things that would be really nice to do would be able to say that, you know, Valacia Rescue took care of a patient, administered naloxone to them. They were discharged from the hospital and directly into medication assisted therapy. But unfortunately, neither Epic, nor Cerner, nor Meditech, nor any of the other big hospital side EHRs have created a common language interface to the NEMSIS data that actually allows the, the NEMSIS variables to be used as discrete variables within the hospital EHRs. So while we're a couple of steps closer because we can move some data back and forth, and um, I'm actually really happy with what we have so far with the EMS charts interface at, at the med. Um, that's fantastic. And today, the data that I just shared was because of the uh, open access that we have to EMS charts from almost every agency across uh, the region uh, from our regional position. Um, unfortunately, EMS 
uh, continues to be sort of sidelined by the uh, um, by the process throughout healthcare. Hopefully, COVID will allow us the opportunity um, to get some of this data into positions where we'll be able to work with it a little bit more cleanly and be able to look at it in the hospitals. Because from a hospital side, we need to know these things. We have a responsibility in the hospitals to be able to give feedback for exposures, um, and we need to be able to work with EMS in order to assure outcomes. So we need the data. It's just a question of being able to convince the data management folks that they should invest in getting us there. Hey, Mike, it's Art. Yes, sir. All right, you're still muted. He unmuted and unmuted himself. There you go, Art. Speak. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, the same thing, you know, I agree with Mike, uh, what he just said, um, you know, and I think something has to happen. Hopefully it will. Um, there is a piece of EMS charts that w uh, we can use as an analytical um, piece as well that will take the HL7 um, or the, the EHR from the hospital and run it through EMS charts. It's a short-term gap. But I think the language needs to be there, like Mike said, uh, you know, to align up with uh, Nemesis. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that um, we are still at Albany Med going through roadblocks uh, with Albany Med. There's a lot of stuff that could be automated that I still have to do manually. And there are people that are saying, no, we should not let that ADT information flow. Art, so a lot of that is still a manual process. Is that what you're saying? The um, all the COVID information feedback that's coming back and any of the feedback about outcomes of the patient is, is all manual process. The insurance information, the spelling of the name, um, that stuff is, is automated. That's unfortunate. I was led to believe that a lot of that was now being automated. It could be, but we haven't gone that far yet. We automated the part by sending Art home and connecting him to his computer eight hours a day, which frankly is doing a, a fantastic job of getting these um, updates out. So hopefully at some point we can get this all automated, but it doesn't look like that's happening immediately anywhere unless we consider Art being a robot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any other discussion today? Uh, yes, I'd like to bring something up. First off, I'm glad that there is an Art bot. I wish we can uh, multiply you across every hospital. He's patented uh, himself. But the, uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is the sprayers that Remo uh, has put out. I think that's been a wonderful thing. It's going to really paint Remo in a very nice light. But I have a question, which is, after the original drum of disinfectant runs out, do we have a plan to continue this service? Is this a one-time deal? What's going on with the Victory sprayer system in a big picture sense? Hey, Doc, it's Tim. Uh, my plan was hopefully to continue this as long as I have buy-in from all the locations that graciously uh, offered, you know, to house them there. Um, I think it's going to be a bridge we're going to have to cross, but my plan was to keep these things there and utilize them after this headache is over with. 
Great. Okay. And do we have a line on funding for those? Each barrel is $1,200 if you buy them individually, obviously less if we buy them in bulk. I haven't got that far yet. The barrels are actually about seven, 800 bucks, um, which is not cheap either. Uh, but I haven't thought about a funding line for that yet. Okay. Have any, any suggestions? Let me know. All right, I will. Um, for anyone who, who is in charge of that program, I'm writing up some education and some emails to put out. I'd be more than happy to share that if anybody wants it. Hi, Bruce. This is Steve. The, the Regional EMS Council will be working with Tim on sustainability of this program. Um, that would be great. Thank you. Because, of course, it's great for meningitis and flu and everything else as well. Yep. Okay, so for those of you outside, looks you've got a head start on us. Um, can we get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. I'll second. Okay. So it's June, so we'll see everybody in the spring then. Uh, fall. Okay. Spring, fall, something like that. <laughs> is, is there a difference? What day of the week is this? Let's <laughs> let, let's um, let's keep it open for uh, for us to do Zoom calls in between if we need. Sure. Um, you know, <clears throat> it's been uh, it's been a rocky road so far. Let's see where we go from here. But um, hopefully, we'll all be chatting uh, next in September unless something comes up where we need to chat before. Sounds good. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thank Take you care. all.